Amen. Let's take our Bibles this morning and open them to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to be in verses 13 and 14 today. The sermon is titled, Your Taste of Glory Now. Hopefully I can remember how to preach. It's been a while. That was Sunday school class for the... I don't know, uh, probably the first time in 20 years or better. Uh, when I was on vacation, I had some weird stomach thing come up and didn't go to church Sunday. Uh, Jennifer and her mom and the rest of the kids and everybody went to uh, First Baptist of Sevierville, but uh, I was laid up on the hotel couch. Didn't exactly know what you do. On a Sunday, you're not in church. I'm just sitting there looking out the window, like, is this normal? Do, you, do people at this church just do this? Or, you know, but uh, worship at first Baptist couch spring that day. All right, Ephesians 1 13 and 14. I'm going to read here from verse 3 to kind of set the context for us, but we're going to be focusing on 13 and 14. The Apostle Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ, for he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted through Jesus Christ for himself, according to his favor and will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he favored us with in the beloved. In him we have redemption for his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he planned in him for the administration of the days of fulfillment to bring everything together in the Messiah, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. In him we were also made his inheritance, predestined according to the purpose of the one who works out everything in agreement with the decision of his will, so that we who had already put our hope in the Messiah might bring praise to his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in him, when you believed, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. He is the down payment of our inheritance for the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, as we come before you in Jesus' name, we thank you for allowing us to hear your word and to look into it this morning. And we pray, God, that you would give our hearts and our minds understanding of your truth and that through your spirit we would be transformed by it. Help us to see, God, the deposit you have made for us to be eternally yours in heaven today. That we would see what we have in you, what we have received from you, and that we would glorify you for it. And that we would see the change that you make in our lives, the change that each and every one of us need. And I just pray, God, that you would help me, your weakest of servants, to proclaim this word and for it to be proclaimed in such a way that your power goes forth to all of our hearts, that all of our hearts and lives would change from you. That you, God, would receive all the honor and the glory and the praise. And we just pray all of these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. All throughout my life, I have enjoyed getting little taste of wonderful things, taste of things that are to come. I can remember when I was a very, very young man, I would get so excited about Christmas morning that I guess I aggravated my mother so much, she would often give me one present on Christmas Eve night, just as a little taste of what was going to come the next day. Jennifer does a similar thing to me. When she is fixing food a lot of times, she'll take a fork and she'll put it into that food and put a little bit of the food on that fork and she'll come so that I can have a little taste of what is to come. Now, the food is the same food that's going to be served at lunch, but I need it ahead of time, you see. I need to be able to check it out just a little bit. I guess you could say that the women in my life have always spoiled me, and I do not regret it one bit at all. 
We were down in Gatlinburg last week, and we went in through this place called the Chocolate Monkey. Oh. And while we're in the Chocolate Monkey, they have every manner of fudge and on the man in there. And I noticed that a little girl ahead of me got a little taste of that fudge. And Jennifer said, oh, yeah, they'll give you a free sample of it. Yes, they will. I found out a little taste of what was to come. You know, God gives me little taste of what's to come all the time. Almost every morning during the week, I'm able to see the sun come up and peek out over the horizon. Just a little taste of what's about to come forward that day. Every Sunday, God gathers me together with a little group of his people. Just a little taste of what it's going to be like when I worship with all of God's people in heaven. We need these little tastes to constantly remind us of our future in Christ, that we in the present might keep our hearts and our minds set to him, that we would remember that this life is not all there is, that we are here for a reason, here for a purpose, that we are headed towards a very special destination in him. And today in our scripture, we are seeing the greatest of all little tastes that God gives us as we see here the God of all the universe, the holy God, the one true and living God, an infinite being so expansive that heaven and earth cannot contain him. We see here the desire in his heart to be good to us by letting us know of a little taste he has already given us of the glory to come. And it comes through the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. What God is showing us today is that the taste of glory that we now experience by God's indwelling spirit is the assurance that God will bring us to heaven's glory at last. It is going to happen, dear friend. Now, he reveals this to us by telling us that the Holy Spirit of God has sealed us, that he is himself the down payment of our inheritance for the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. And we need to carefully unravel this gift that God gives us here, that we would be greatly encouraged by it and strengthened in our faith by his love and grace to us. So let's begin by asking a few questions this morning, the first of them being, how do we become sealed in the Spirit? Paul says that we are sealed in the Spirit, that we are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. How exactly does that happen? When Paul says this, he is referring here to an incredible promise that our Lord made to us when he walked upon this earth in John 14. He told us that a helper would come, that we would receive a paraclete, one who comes alongside us to aid us in the way. Jesus said that he would send the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in his name, and he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. And we see this promise of the Spirit to come to believers once Jesus ascended into the heavens and took his seat at the right hand of God. God said that then the Spirit would come to us. God would be with us to help us and to guide us. Jesus said in John 16, 13, that when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. That is an amazing, amazing promise. You see, we cannot all be with Jesus face to face. Like all of us at one time can't be there with him. But Jesus says that's okay. We don't all have to be face to face with Jesus because Jesus is going to spend, send to us the Holy Spirit and through the Holy Spirit, we will all be with God, and God will be with us. I don't want to blow anybody's mind here now, especially with some of the looks I'm getting, especially y'all who are asleep. Uh, I don't want to blow any minds out of the water here, but believe it or not, if you are a believer in Christ Jesus, God himself is actually with you right now and with us all here in this place. Amen. 
Now everybody wakes up. There we go. That's what I'm doing. It's an incredible reality that God has provided for us that the Holy Spirit would be with us, that we might be with God and he would be with us. Now putting that promise together with Paul's word in verse 13, what we find is that we are sealed with the Spirit by hearing and believing the gospel. Paul plainly says, in Christ you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in him when you believed, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. The good news of God to mankind <coughs> is that though we are lost in sin and rebellion against him and were the recipients of the full fires of hell, God in his grace has provided a way for us to be saved, and that way is through his son, Christ Jesus. Jesus suffered the sinner's fate on the cross, and God says that he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God loves you so much that he would die for you and suffer your guilt, your shame and your punishment that you could be saved from the wrath of God against you and be born again through the Holy Spirit to know God and live God's wonderful will for your life and it all happens by these two things hearing and believing the gospel and I want to make a point of that because Paul so plainly says that right when you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in him when you believe so you heard it and you believed it and Paul says, when that happens, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. I want to make a point here. Bringing us all to the realization that we are sealed by hearing and believing the gospel. And you're sitting there saying, okay, preacher, why are you making such a big deal about this? Because a great deal of Christianity goes way astray at this point. There's a lot of Christianity that will tell you <clears throat> that you become sealed with the Holy Spirit not by hearing and believing the gospel, but by water baptism. But you'll notice there that Paul did not add water baptism to that equation. He says you heard it, you believed it, and when you believed you were sealed. It's very, very simple progress. Also, there's others in Christianity that will say that you are not truly sealed with the Holy Spirit unless you come forth speaking in tongues. But you notice Paul did not add tongues to this equation. You heard it, you believed it, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit. It is by faith that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. One theologian, he says that hearing is vital because by hearing alone comes the knowledge of the truth of the gospel. But hearing in vain is vain unless it leads to faith, the means by which alone God's blessings can be received. It's not enough to hear. It's not enough to hear. <clears throat> we must also believe. We must trust and follow the Christ of this good news. We must surrender our lives to him that his life might become ours. <coughs> and I need to make a point of this as well. See, I'm, I'm not real worried about anybody up in here believing that it's through water baptism that you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. I'm not worried about that. I'm not real worried about you saying that uh, you know you have to speak in tongues in order to to be sealed with the Holy Spirit. I'm not concerned about that. What I, what I am concerned about, this is our danger, is that we can stop at the hearing part of this and ignore that Paul is saying you have to hear and believe in order to be sealed. We stop at the hearing and we think that that's belief, but it's not. 
Let me tell you what we have created in the culture of the church today because of this thing. We have created a church culture that is so decision driven that we have filled the pews with unregenerate people but we've convinced them they're saved. I want to be explicitly clear here. It's not enough to hear. It's not even enough to say, I believe the ABCs, admit, believe, and confess. There must be a change of heart. When, when Paul is saying here that you believed, he is saying that you trust Jesus as Savior, which everybody does that, right? That's no problem. But you also trust him as Lord. Because he's not schizophrenic. Yeah. He, will, he will be both of these things to you or he will be neither. So when Paul is saying, in him when you believe, Paul is saying you believe like I did. You turn from your sins and you turn to follow Jesus as Lord. You trusted in him to save you. And you were sealed by the Holy Spirit. I just wanted to make clear that reality. That the salvation and the gospel of Jesus is a gospel that requires us to hear and to believe. And believe means to trust and obey. That's how we become sin. We heard, we believed the gospel of Christ Jesus. Now, let's ask secondly today, what does it mean to be sealed in the Holy Spirit. When we look through the Bible, here's what we find about this word sealed in the Spirit. Being sealed means that we are authentic believers. It means that our faith is real. In Romans 4, Paul talks about a man named Abraham. And he shows that Abraham was counted righteous before God solely by faith in the Lord. As Paul says in verse 11, that he, Abraham, received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith when he was still uncircumcised. In other words, Paul or Abraham believed God, followed circumcision. That circumcision was a seal that he belonged to God. So we see here that being sealed indicates that you are a bona fide believer in Christ. And we also see in the Bible that being sealed means we are protected. In Revelation 7, 3, we see that as the angels of God are about to bring God's wrath upon the earth, they are instructed, don't harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we seal the slaves of our God on their foreheads. So sealed there is referring to being protected. You know, when I was growing up, the driveway in my grandfather's driveway was rock. And then they come through and put some blacktop on it one day. And religiously, my grandfather put sealer on that driveway. Why does he do that? To protect the blacktop, right? I got a, a little trailer to haul my four-wheeler around. And when I got it, I went and got some wood sealer to seal my trailer from the elements. It's protection. Granddad protects the driveway. I protect my trailer. God is saying here, when you are sealed in the Holy Spirit, you are protected. Protected from what? Protected from going to hell. That's what you're protected from. He said, well, what about protected from demons and Satan? You're already protected from them. Don't be giving them more credit than they're due. You're already protected from that. What you need to be concerned about is this faith. God is saying, I protect those who hear and believe the gospel of my son unto everlasting life. <coughs> we are safe. We are secure from all alarm. Now, let's talk about this more thirdly here and how being sealed in the spirit is our security. Paul says that the spirit that sealed us is the down payment of our inheritance for the redemption of the possession. My brothers and sisters, we have been and we have seen now as we've been in Ephesians that God's grace has reached out to us powerfully. 
In these first 14 verses, we have seen God just time and time again talk about lavishing his grace on us and, and bringing his mercy to us and all of these glorious things and giving us every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. He's shown us that from top to bottom, he is the author and finisher of our faith. We are not saved because we are good. We're not even saved because we wanted to be saved. We're not saved because we deserve it. We are saved because God determined in eternity past to choose to bring his salvation to an elect people for his son and to bless them with every spiritual blessing in the heavens and to adopt them unto himself. And as the ultimate assurance of our salvation, he gives us the Holy Spirit. On top of it all, he gives us this indwelling spirit. In other words, when you are once saved, you are indeed saved forever. Why is that? Because you didn't work your way into this salvation. You can't work your way out of it. You are saved by grace. Therefore, your salvation is dependent upon the one who gave you that grace. Not dependent upon you because you didn't save yourself in the first place it's dependent upon him and God is saying here that he will not revoke his spirit his forgiveness or his blood from your soul I mean really could you imagine a situation where God saves you through the sacrifice of his son and then takes that sacrifice away that could never happen. He will never undo the seal of the very Holy Spirit on your life. If we were saved by works, then yes, we have reason to fear. But we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace. Listen to what Peter says about this. He says, you are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. God himself is protecting you. You are in his hands. The Spirit assures that you're saved even if you don't feel like you're saved. Friends, there are times in our lives that dark clouds are going to hang over this truth and our feelings might lead us to believe we're not secure in Christ. Satan delights in making you feel this way. Why? Why? Because it makes you question the legitimacy of the crucifixion of Jesus and his resurrection. That's right. Nothing makes the adversary happier than to see you doubt your Savior. And the more you grow in that God complex, the deeper this goes. And you may be saying, what do you mean God complex? Oh, yeah. Listen, if you're sitting there and you're saying, you know, I know Jesus can forgive his sins, and I know Jesus can forgive her sins, but I don't know that Jesus can forgive my sins. It's not because your sins are so great. Your arrogance is so great. Yeah. And your arrogance is being revealed by the fact that you have this God complex that something in you is greater than the promises of God himself. It is not. There's only one sin he will not forgive. And that is the sin of unbelief that never seeks forgiveness from him. That will not be forgiven except by repentance and faith. And sometimes we may even look through God's word and we find scriptures there that kind of give us pause because they're not these these scriptures like we're seeing in Ephesians that we love, they're scriptures that are saying things like, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. They're scriptures that say things like, he who perseveres to the end will be saved. They're scriptures that say, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. 
these verses can give trouble to our security sometimes. Folks, I once had a lady get very, very, very upset with me because I had preached on some of these hard passages. You know, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And she was upset with me because she said I had robbed her of her eternal security. Now, I get where she's coming from. I don't particularly like to hear these verses either. But here's the thing. When God says something like, whosoever will believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And when God says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, he who endures to the end will be saved. God is not saying two different things. He's saying the same thing. We just like to hear one way of it. We don't like to hear the other way of it. But it's God's love that tells us, yes, when you come to me by faith, I save you by grace, and you are once saved, always saved forever, but you don't make my grace cheap. I will save you to the fullest extent, but I require everything that you are. That's the difference. So when you see God say something like, turn from your sin or you will die, and see God say something like, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, he's saying the same thing. He's not saying one thing for you to lose your salvation and saying another thing for you to have it forever. He's saying you will have it forever and this is how you have it. It's like this. Here's one for you. Ready for this one? Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Man, does that one just smack American Christianity or what? Hey, we don't like that, man. No, we want salvation. We love Jesus. We love the Bible. But don't be telling me how I have to live. <laughs> In other words, we want Jesus to be the type of God we make him to be. Not the type of God he is. The type of God he is says, I will save to the uttermost all who call upon my name. And if you call upon my name, you need to know that holy that you're never going to see. It's the same thing. He's not talking about two different concepts. And it all drives us to this reality. That the Spirit in us is our guarantee of salvation. And this makes us confront our scripture today with eyes wide open. God is here saying that all who have heard and believed, all who have listened and received Christ according to the gospel, if you have done that, then you are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit forever saved, forever protected, forever locked up in the heart of Christ himself. One theologian comments, in the ancient world, the seal was the personal sign of the owner of the sender of something important, and thus, as in a letter, it distinguished what was true from what was spurious. It was also the guarantee that the thing sealed had been carried intact. That seal says that you are saved of God and you will be delivered intact to the shores of heaven. Doesn't it give your heart peace that surpasses all understanding to know that the Spirit is your taste today of God's assured salvation of your life tomorrow? In other words, the reality of God's salvation is truly operating in us as evidenced by the work of the Spirit of God within us. You'll know He's in you as He changes you. And that can be tough. And a lot of times I look at myself and, and I think, you know, there's just no growth here at all. But when I really, really think about it, there is. I love things now that I used 
to hate. I hate things now that I used to love. I once may have loved adultery, I hate it now. I once may have hated going to church on Sunday, I love it now. Maybe there's things in your life that you're seeing, yeah, I'm not the man I used to be. Where did that come from? It didn't come from me and it didn't come from you. It came from the Spirit of God living within us. Friends, let me let me take a moment here since I'm just going all offensive in the Christian spectrum today. The, the main difference between an unbeliever and a believer is not going to come in what you do with your hands. Listen, Christians can support pound puppies just like atheists can. It's not going to come in what you do with your hands, although that is important. It's not going to come in what you give to. The atheist can give to the cancer society just like you. It's not going to come in what your hands do and what you write checks for. The difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is the delight of their heart. That's the difference. Do I delight in Christ? If so, the Spirit of God is definitely in me. Because I would not delight in Him apart from that. That's the difference. What does your heart delight in? Are we fighting battles now that we wouldn't and couldn't fight before? Do we have tastes now that are completely different from the taste we had when we were in our sin? Do we have joy now? True joy from God. Not joy as the world gives, but joy as Christ gives. We have went from being darkness to light, decay to salt, lips that curse to having lips that bless all through the Holy Spirit who dwells our hearts. The Spirit of God has changed us so that our lives have taken on the quality of heaven because we have heaven's God indwelling us and sealing us to himself forever. Take, take a look at how wonderfully this is described in verse 14. Watch this. Paul says that the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance. What is a down payment? You go to buy that new Harley Davidson, right? That thing costs $65,000. That's more money than you make in five years. I don't know. But you know you're not going to pay no sixty-five thousand for it, but maybe, maybe you could scrape by and put six hundred down, and they're okay. Same thing for the house, right? Down payment on the house. What does that down payment mean? It means there's more payment going to come until we own it at last. I ask Jennifer at least once a month, "How much longer have I got on my truck?" She'll say, "Whatever," and I'll be like. That's what it was a year ago. Are we paying on this thing? They haven't taken it away, so I guess we are. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance. Our inheritance is heaven. That's right. If we have the Spirit, then we know, we know we're headed to heaven forever. Modern Greeks use the same word in the Greek for down payment. They use that same word for engagement ring. You go to Greece today, and that, that same word is used for the engagement ring. A promise, a pledge today for who you're going to marry in the future. And, and God is here saying that the Holy Spirit that's been given to us is God's pledge to us for heaven. Specifically, the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance for the redemption of the possession. The redemption of the possession. That is to say... That God is bringing us into a day and a time where he when he will redeem us in such a way that we might possess heaven. We're not fit to possess it now. Right? Does anybody want to possess heaven in these bodies? I mean, angelic choirs are great, but they lose a bit of their luster if you have to listen through and hear an aid to hear them. Right? It, it's great to worship around the throne of God, 
but something is taken away from it, if you've got to pull back for a moment to take your answer, we're not ready for him. We don't want to go to heaven like this. We don't want to go to heaven with these minds. Yes, they're renewed by the grace of God, but they're still fallen. We're not ready. But God is saying here that the spirit that is in our hearts is the down payment of the inheritance for a redemption, the redemption of the possession. This means God is going to make us fit for heaven and God is going to take us into heaven forever. And the assurance of that is that he is in our hearts now with the Holy Spirit and he will do this all. Paul says in verse 14, he'll do it all to the praise of his glory. It's all about him. And he wants you and he wants me to be fully assured of this amazing hope by giving us this taste of future glory today. He wants us to take our security in him and in him alone for this life and for the life to come. That's why he gives us a little taste of glory now by giving us the Holy Spirit to lead us, guide us, strengthen us, convict us, and encourage us and empower us. And I pray that you have that little taste of heaven. It, it could be. It could be that you're here today and you got another little taste going on. Because you've heard all that Paul is saying here. And you've heard these things proclaimed. And you've heard this joy of this little taste of heaven now by the Spirit of God within us. And you're sitting there and you're saying, I don't know. I just don't have that. Let me tell you what you're receiving if you don't have that. What you're receiving is a little taste, not of heaven today, but of hell today. Your little taste that you're getting is a little taste of what it is to be separated from God forever. And I pray that it will stop with the little taste you're getting today. That you will turn to Jesus as you have heard the gospel today. I pray that you will believe the gospel today and that today you will have that indwelling spirit within you that assures you God is yours. Christ has saved you and that he will take you to live with him forever. Would you bow your heads with me?